get best practices, what, what ideas do you have? And it was a really great meeting. They offered us a lot of tools and recommendations that they think they can assist us with. Um, some of those being the board has Instagram and Facebook, whereas our current social media uh, is Twitter. And so um, talking about launching onto those platforms, they did uh, express uh, that they would prefer that we wait until the new executive officer comes on board on August 1st just to make sure that what we're doing is in his or her alignment with the organization, in alignment with his or her vision for the organization, rather. So, but in the meantime, um, because we do have a Twitter handle, they requested access to it to kind of do some research to see how we can enhance our um, Twitter activity in addition to um, they want to uh, verify the account. Uh, so I guess like a celebrity has their account verified. So too with LATC to say, you know, the messages coming from this handle are from the campaign website. So that's where we're at with that objective right now. Um, as more tangible items come about, we will certainly keep the committee advised. Um, during the same meeting, we also discussed with Public Affairs Office the objective to consult with uh, their office to optimize the LATC website on search engine. Um, from the strategic planning conducted um, two years ago, um, it, the purpose of the objective was so that a consumer or someone um, searching landscape architecture on a search engine like Google um, would, you know, get search results that yielded pretty high up landscape architect technical committee. Um, so we discussed this with the Public Affairs Office. They said this is certainly a doable thing. One thing that they did caution, or not so much caution, but just said we'd like to wait until um, until implementation of our new developmental website. Uh, just because the coding of that site is a little bit more up to date than the coding of this site, and I guess it will, I apologize that I'm not very technical, <laughs> but the way that our coding would be speaks better to, um, let's say, what Google will be pulling that data. Um, so again, as um, we have more tangibles with this, we will present them to the committee, but we're, we're taking a step forward. And then um, to uh, piggyback off of that, um, the third strat plan objective that I wanted to highlight was revamping of the website to um, the new iteration that we presented to the committee um, in the meeting uh, last in May. Um, so following the committee's review and approval of the website, we provided it to the department's Office of Information Services. Um, relay to them some of the uh, revisions that the committee desired for the website. And they did request a meeting with staff on June 28th just because they wanted to do some back-end changes, nothing that was reflective of anything presented on the site. It was more coding related for their own ease of maintenance. Um, so we approved that and they expressed that they anticipate launching the website on August, at the end of August. Sorry here, I just got a phone, I don't know how to figure out how to turn it on silent, okay. sorry. No, no. Um, so they're going to be launching the site at the end of August. Before they do, they're going to certainly give us a, a pretty good heads up so that we can um, let stakeholders know we plan to issue. We have the subscriber blast that we send. We'll, we'll send one out letting everyone know the website will be down on this day for a period of time while we transition. So those are the three main updates I really wanted to highlight in this monthly report. Certainly if the committee has any questions about those or any other portions of the report, I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, I have a question. So on page 15, it talks about the LATC examination program and the um, update occupational analysis. Is that at this point, is this where this um, looks at the reference list? To, to my whole thing about updating this. So to provide some context about what you're speaking of, you, you expressed concern that the reference list um, encapsulated on the study guide for the CSB perhaps has some outdated material. Um, certainly, the occupational analysis right now is current, but I believe they are revised every five to seven years, and we last completed ours in 2014. And so next year would be a time where we would start to look into potentially revising it. And then at that time, we could certainly look into the references. So this well. can't change till every five years? No, but to answer your question about the occupational analysis, we can certainly find those. Okay, but we could potentially make changes to it prior to that point or not. We can certainly evaluate it. Okay. 
Okay. Just prior to that point, yeah. My reasoning for this, the documents are the, you get in the room to write the questions, you're sequestered, you can't bring anything in, you have a card, and about five of the books are from 1997 that you're supposed to use to write questions. So like they put in here, time saver standards, which says provide ADA, and that's the, that's for what you have to write questions from. And so, I, I mean, this is kind of, you're going to, you know, I mean, this is kind of what I keep going back to, is that this is what we're asking people to use for study material. If the committee chooses to examine that and make sure it's up to date, what you can do, because we're not at the NOAA's right. an occupation analysis cycle, um, you can add it as a strat plan objective, and we have strategic planning in November, so it could be an objective. And so by bringing this up now, does that then get on the agenda or? No, no, so just, your next meeting will be your strategic planning session. So at that point, it, you could bring out the issue and if the committee chooses to have that, it be as an objective then we do that. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah. so we'll get it on the agenda. Uh, it'll be no. strategic it'll, it'll be, be part a of discussion. Of discussion. discussion. Because it, 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 the purpose of the strategic planning is to make sure the committee's in agreement what you want staff and the program to focus on. So if things are brought up during meetings and it's not part of the strat plan, you might find yourself diverting in different directions, working on things that maybe the committee as a whole doesn't want to reach. So that's part of the reason for the planning. So in the part of the other reason I'm bringing it up is Milo isn't even listed on here as one of your resources. And it's probably because that resource list is based on the last OA that was done and the tests that are developed off of that OA. The resource material isn't to um, be like current, up-to-date codes. It's for re resources for the exam that we were administering. Right, I understand. So we're having a whole discussion about the Moello today, but it doesn't have it listed on here. And it's been around for more than five years, so. I mean, as I'm reading through here, I'm going, but then you go online and you look at this, this stuff, kind of stuff's not on there. So it would depend whether or not that's in the current exam or OA or stuff. It is, questions are on the exam that I was into detail. Okay, yeah, I won't. Okay, great. Okay, sorry for <laughs> yeah. har harping on this, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions about the monthly report or Captain one section? Then I will move on to attachment two, which is the agenda for the board meeting. The board met on June 13th uh, in Sacramento. As mentioned just a few minutes ago, um, the board did have um, closed session to conduct interviews, and they did select an executive officer um, who, again, will start on August 1st. Um, thereafter, the committee, uh, the board had the committee report update on the May 4th LATT meeting, um, during which time we did, and I just provided it as a handout for reference, uh, we did receive public comment related to the May 4th meeting, so I provided to you all to, to just to have handy, and there was oral public comment delivered as well uh, relative to the May 4th meeting. Um, and then the actionable piece related to the LATC at the meeting was that we provided the disciplinary guidelines that the committee approved in May, and um, we offered it to them for their review and approval, which they did. So now our next step is to just get started on promulgating that regulatory change. And of course, Patricia, you were there as well. So if there's anything you would like to add. Um, I think the, um, the CAF uh, deals with a lot of the same issues that we deal with. They, they struggle with them. Um, um, you know, dealing with uh, people that are, are not licensed, that are trying to practice as an architect. So that was, that was an interesting discussion. Um, they did ask, um, I did clarify at one point um, about our meetings on Fridays and why we had it, because they were asking why there was a gap. You know, it was five months, four months before we had a meeting the first of the year, and I just said it was because we moved them to Friday so that we can accommodate, oh, excuse me, um, <laughs> we can um, accommodate uh, more people participating in the meeting. And um, just makes it a little bit more difficult.
Okay, I just need to start around that into the mic. So, right, thanks for inviting me. Yes. that's coming to the Model Water Ocean Landscape Ordinance, which is basically the building code for landscaping. And it occurs in two sections of the state law, in Title 23 for waters, and Title 24 in the building code. So, um, we are right, we're still kind of here. This was a picture from Lake Orville, when we had a good rainfall here, and then in 15, the year after the drought was uh, started, kind of started. Um, this is the second largest reservoir in the state, and as you can see, it was pretty, pretty extreme emergency. Every reservoir just about was looking like this. Uh, we were not quite where South Africa was recently, but getting close. So, in 2015, the um, governor ordered that we update the annual for the emergency, along with a lot of other so the, in 15, the um, in real change that the water budget was reduced, and for the first time since beginning in 1993, the plant palette had to change. It's always been a moderate plant, average plant factor, so it was one third high, one third medium, one third low. But in 2015, because of the drought emergency, the plant palette had to change, and those are for drought survival reasons plants that could handle the current, at that time, uh, watering restrictions, because you can't establish high water use plants on one day a week watering. And, you know, a lot of thought went into it, even though it was an emergency and it was done very quickly. Not be reactionary just to drought, and just move to a sustainable future. So, um, they require that we are in sync with Title 24 for the building codes, because Unfortunately, the way the timing goes in their rulemaking and our rulemaking when we write regulations, we've kind of been out of sync a little bit, which is confusing to the design build community and cities. So we're going to be more in sync. Um, and the bill had was a pretty small bill, and the goals of it were to improve water efficiency, of course, improve administration. So we want it to be easier for the cities and easier for the applicants to use and comply and consistent timing with California. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah, there's no air circulation. The humidity, for those of us NorCal people, we're all probably all dying from the humidity. It was 105 two days ago where we lived, but this is worse. <laughs> so anyway, moving on. Um, so to that end, we formed a stakeholder community. Um, we recruited a lot of people in late 2016. I just sent out lots of emails to all of my peeps, as my friend called them. Everybody I had in my address book um, contacted all the major organizations, associated with landscape professionals, and invited people to join. We ended up with almost 400 people joining the stakeholder group. And some caveats that I required of them is that they weren't just going to complain about what was wrong, they were going to actually work to help find solutions. Because if we didn't find them, we can't be expected to keep finding them if we don't have any help. You know, we, we understand the problems, help us with the solutions. So, um, all these great people from all parts of the landscape industry have been helping. Um, right now, the initial project is update, but we intend to keep the landscape stakeholder advisory group going after the update because we want to keep the conversation open for all kinds of information about landscaping. We did have four big meetings last year and lots and lots of good work with people. So these are just some of the organizations and occupations that were represented in um, in our LSAT group. So, it, I think we got a really good mix. We didn't get everybody, because you never can get everybody, but we got people from the design side, from the build side, the permitting side. Um, the one group that kind of was involved, but is 
not as much as I would like within the nursery industry. So they were kind of involved. They hosted our first meeting in 17, but not as involved as I would like. So I hope that will change. So we formed six work groups um, in April of last year, and these are the four groups, or six groups that formed, uh, they kind of still selected what they wanted to talk about and deal with, and a lot of, there was a lot of overlap, so some people worked in more than one group. Uh, they wanted to look at the codes, the landscape plan, the irrigation plan, how the cities deal with planning issues, the water budget, and existing landscape. And during the conversations that ensued for the rest of the year, two more groups formed on their own, people dealing with trees and urban forestry and the stormwater and rainwater capture issues. So the process um, was that uh, after they formed their eight work groups, they met and organized conference calls and had professional, professional facilitators working with us. And all these people submitted issues that they wanted to talk about. They would uh, copy text if they had a problem with write out a regulation and discuss it. It was all organized in spreadsheets and many, 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 many hours of phone calls for these folks. They really have given, and they're all volunteers, um, especially those that are self-employed. They're really the, um, the heroes of it because it came out of their own time. It wasn't like people on the clock. Some of these people gave of their own personal time, and we really appreciate it. So, and they tried to reach consensus on what they wanted to recommend to us, and then they gave us all their ideas in February of this year. So these are some of the recommendations that they gave, and uh, this will be off, um, posted on the website very soon, so you'll be able to see. There's a few members here, like Amelia and Mark. Was anybody else here? Part of that part of group. Okay, Amelia and Mark were uh, part of that. So um, these are some of the recommendations. Like it's mostly for improving the clarity, and, uh, resolving ambiguity, and those kinds of things. There wasn't any suggestions to change the water budget, budget other than maybe adding some things like artificial turf and pervious hardscapes. And all the reports will be posted on the web very soon. And here's some more, and I don't expect you to read them all, but if the uh, PowerPoint's available, then you can look at it. But, um, one thing that's kind of controversial that we're not sure on how it's going to resolve yet is some people, in, uh, especially down here in San Diego area, are asking for a higher leaching fraction for the receptive water. A higher what? Leaching fraction. Oh. Leaching requirement because the water, the recycled water here tends to be a little saltier than in other places because your source water is saltier and then of course recycling leaves salts in it. So when whenever an agency writes a regulation, it's called rulemaking and it's capitalized, it's a a very specific process that we have to follow, a legal process, very spelled out. And so we're not there yet. Um, we want to do as much beforehand with the LSAT group and the public at large before we actually start the official rulemaking. So we're working on all those recommendations that were given to us about in, the middle in, in February. We're, we're looking at them with the eye of will improve the clarity for you users, will it improve the administration for the applicants and the cities, will it um, resolve this ambiguity so that there's different interpretations from site to site, and does the statute, the ADA 1881, which is still in effect, give us the authority and the direction, and we also don't want to cause undue fiscal impact, and will the city work for it? And will it improve the built environment? And we are coordinating with the uh, building standards and housing and people in development because they write to help me and we are working with them. Uh, we do plan to have two more meetings and uh, we'll have that notice very soon. So when we do go into the official rulemaking, we have a very specific set of legal 
um, instructions you have to follow. We'll write a, a statement of reasons which explains the changes we are making and why we're making them. We'll hold public hearings. We'll have, accept comments from the entire public. Anybody interested can comment. We have to respond to them. And then we may have to have additional comment periods based on changes that we made. So we have one year to do this. So that's why we're trying to get as much done in advance. So right now, I'm working um, drafting proposed amendments based on recommendations that we got in February. Uh, I have to write the justification of why we're doing it, because it has to be explained both to the Office of Administrative Law and the public and why we're making certain changes. And I'm going to talk to the LSAC. We're going to have a couple more. Oh, I, we're not going to have the meetings next week. We're going to probably schedule them next week. That probably will be next. So the next steps, um, well, some meetings and a review period for the LSAC community. Uh, we have to brief the California Water Commission. And we'll probably start the rulemaking in September or October. So what is that, you know, uh, I don't have anything really to show you about what the text looks like, so I wanted to explain to you where we're going, how we're going to get there. So we have actually over a thousand people on our notification list, and the LSAT group um, is close to 400, it's so about 380. And if anybody here wants to join us not already a member, please just give me your card. I have cards to give out. Um, you want to sign people up, at least help yourself to my cards here and pass the word around because the more people will get involved. You know, as citizens, we always complain about the laws the government passes, but if we don't get involved, we have no ch opportunity to change that the way we think it should be. So this is your opportunity you know, as a profession and as a person, state that a citizen of California. So that's what I have because I don't really have any text to show you, but I can answer questions. I'm when do you expect to the time the public time to uh, comment uh, to begin? When? No, when? Um, well, I think we plan to publish the text and probably have to And there will be a 45 day comment period at that point as soon as the uh, regulation proposal is published. Now, 45 days, we hold a couple hearings, probably one up north and one down here somewhere. And then they will get the comments and they'll all be public. The comments will be public. We'll work on them and show our responses, change the regulation uh, based on what we hear and then we'll have another comment period. Because when is it convenient to uh, send everything to the legislatures? Well, uh, the, the law says that it has to go into effect January 1st, 2020. So we're not going to, our rulemaking will not be in sync with Cal Green because they have, their rulemaking is a little different to where they have Six months to publish. <laughs> it's a loud one. Six months to publish and a six month, just about a six month waiting period. So they have once they finish the regulation, they sit on it for nearly a year. We can be finished in December of 2019 and it will still go into effect. As long as it's approved by OAL, the Office of Administrative Law, once they sign off on it, it becomes a regulation January 1st. So the effective date is January 1st, 2020 for both Cal Green and our regulation. So as long as we, we do everything right and get the sign off, then it is going to affect them. So we have time built in in our schedule for at least three common periods. And that's why we've been working with the LSAC all this time to resolve, to get the good language proposed to resolve issues. 
so that when we do go to the public at large, we're hoping to go a little bit more smoother because we've already vetted it very thoroughly to the industry. Hey, Mark. Hey, um, will the MLO update be a part of or written into the Title 24 update? Yes. The way they're going to do the construction right now in their rulemaking, and they're going to have some code advisory council meetings in August. And that's when they vet it to their community. And it's the same community, but they come at it a little different way. Um, they basically won't write it word for word. They will point back to Title 23, the end of Because then they have said that Title 23 is the precedent or um, prevalent I don't remember the right word. That is the, um, I want to give you the right word, but I can't remember. It's the, uh, it's the, or the regulation that is covering support to it. Is it fair to say that this is different than it has been in the past? Uh, I wouldn't say too much. There's been no, um, Recommendation to change the water budget? No, different in, different in so much that before this M wheelo wasn't written into the building code. Okay, yeah, so it's been referenced, I think, since about 2011 okay. in a very thin way. And in 2015, they fully referenced it uh, because of the drought emergency. And we were very out of sync because the way the language was written, they went before us. So the, the rules were out of sync, but we became in sync for the end of, I think, in the end of 15. It would be similar to that where there will be pointers back in Calgary pointing back to the end of the Does that make sense? Oh, it does. Okay. <laughs> um, right now, for the state, is looking at SB 1383 that was passed and now we're um, actually the, the bill was passed and now we're getting into the city. And in there they're trying to create a waste stream that's consistent all over the entire state. And part of that is that uh, there's going to be all these composting requirements by city and by uh, agency. Uh, some are really high percentages, almost up to 70% to reduce what goes to landfill. Green waste is a big part of that. Yeah. And there's composting requirements that if you collect the garbage, you have to green, all the bins throughout the state are color coded and all that. So if you collect the green waste, you have to process it and the cities have to buy it back and use it. So is there anything in this that would start referencing that? For instance, like if you're doing a job in San Jose and you tear down a building, that you have a certificate, you have to go to a certified recycling facility, you have to have it signed and turn back to the city. And this could be something you add notes on your drawing. Uh, right now, uh, nobody has brought that up to me. Right now, we have a compost requirement just for soil health and improvement. Um, we normally, and I, for this time, I'm really fortunate to have an attorney walking me through so that we don't make mistakes of uh, like repeating regulations from other places. And But we can cross-reference. And that is a good point, and I'd appreciate you if you could email me, and then that's something we could put either as a you know, add the composting note on the plan. We're not telling them what to right. say, but we can remind them that they're supposed to say it. And then we're also, for this, uh, one thing that's changing quite a bit is the Emily for the last uh, uh, eight years has had a lot of recommendations and guidance language. That's all coming out because it's inappropriate in the regulation, but we are creating a guidebook. And one of my state groups is an education group, and they're already working on what content we're going to put in it. And that's something that could be more expanded on in the guidebook. Because Cal Green, building standards and the HCD have a great guidebook that we would like to emulate where I will show you the code section and then they'll, in this guidebook you'll have pathways to compliance and resources and all the good stuff that you can't put in a regulation but you still want people to know. 
and there's a million regulations that dovetail, and that's a good place for things to cross reference. But if you could email me that, and I could make sure that we, um, if not in the regulation, at least in the guidebook. And I'm surprised because Cal Recycle is listed on one of your groups that participated. Um, so I'm on the Santa Clara County Recycling and Waste Reduction Committee. Mm -hmm. And this was presented to us as like uh, urgency, the comments are due like now. Okay. And um, as the chair, I penned a letter, like all of our concerns, and it's heavy mandated on like 70% reduction, and then right. the city has to use it back again. And if you don't, you're fine. And if you, you have to find the person who did recycle, and then if the city doesn't find that person, then the city gets fined. And I think it's actually going to be incorporated into Cal Green. It could be. Uh, I have worked a lot with Cal Recycle, but I think my main contact has retired because he hasn't been responding. So I'm, that, that might be why. I'll send you the letter that um, I wrote. But to me, it's a big part because it's all about green waste and yeah, that kind of stuff. Thank you. Yeah, so I think um, part of the ordinance says water efficient landscape ordinance, but it really is resource efficient. Uh, we have a secondary mandate as DWR water supply and water quality is our first mandate, and second mandate is electrical conservation and energy conservation. And we also um, see the value in soils, and you know we wanted this to be much more holistic and, and making sure people are using organics. There has been laws on the books for quite a while that they've had to divert like half of the waste stream to recycle and reuse, and, and over time those percentages do go up. So um, they may have been seen, I'm just guessing here, but they may have been seen that their conversion rates were not being met, so they up the ante. Because a lot of times landfills will use green waste as alternative that they would cover over the garbage, so keep the birds out of there and stuff. Because I know on, um, some cities have a whole soil management plan you have to write, talk about fertilizer and all that. And that one of the big issues is, is will the person who provides back the uh, soil management have a certification so that when you get the soil back, they're certifying that there's no disease. Yeah. Yeah. Well, pesticide residue is a real big problem in green waste compost sometimes. Um, you know, and also the uh, level of decomposition. Because sometimes you've probably gotten compost that really looked like bark or mulch or something and it wasn't compost. Okay. Um, I just want to go through. Yeah, thank you. I am proposing a very simple no. Uh, of course, this is my proposal, not it hasn't gone to my management, so I don't know if it's going to stay to the LSAG meeting. But because of this salt uh, issue with recycled water, that we're going to recommend um, on landscapes that use highly saline recycled water, that they have some kind of plan on the note about leaching and fertilizer management. Because you don't want to make it worse than you're going to off the soil and kill the plant. And people that don't know how to do their fertilizer correctly, they may not need fertilizer if they use recycled water. Anybody else? Thank you for coming. Thank you for all your work. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, concerning this issue, I would uh, request that the council would use the current Amnilo language that's currently on the books and our current Landscape Architects and Practice Act to define who can sign the documents for Amnilo. Um, in my experience with these documents, they, the timing is it's during construction documentation phase of projects that these documents are put on drawings and submitted. So therefore, they're, in my opinion, considered construction documents. So I, you know, it would be nice to have kind of an idea, a legal opinion on who can sign these documents. Yes. I think that's very, very good. Uh, so uh, is that something that we can put on the agenda? Uh, right. In greater detail? Yeah. No, 
soundproof and we can go in there where we can hear everybody and out of here I say we have that I asked them and they said we can move in there when when you when you're ready if we can I'm not sure about the cameraman I'm sorry uh, how does that move yeah logistically <laughs> Uh, well, there would be a number of considerations, including seeing if we have yeah. the webcast ability and video okay. ability. So um, maybe we can do a further assessment on right to see how it could shake out these buildings. Since this next issue is actually something that is going to have some legs, may I make a recommendation to take a brief break to assess that to see if we should move now before we get into this subject? So that everybody can hear. I support that moving now or so assess I, it. I would request a 10 minute break to assess okay. that. Okay. okay. Very good. So let's see, you. it is, um, I think it's about 12 minutes to 11. So we will reconvene at 11 o'clock. Perfect. Any questions about I.1? 
So, um, Brianna, on the on the bylaws, then do they need to make a um, recommendation how to vote in case we have a delegate attending the meeting? Yes. So, um, much like I think we did with the model law last time, we would determine how the vote would happen today. Um, and then if someone is able to be there at the meeting, then that person would issue the committee's vote determined today. But there's no option to provide feedback about the vote. Yeah, the yeah. I was told that someone has to be present at the meeting to provide the bylaws vote. Um, but the election vote, we can certainly mail in and not work out. Do we do we pay dues? I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Oh, sorry. Do we pay dues? I believe we do. Yes, it yes. is an annual due. So we do have annual dues, and un unfortunately, because of the decision to have this out of the country, we may not be able to participate. Well, it's not so much that it's out of the country. All travel must be mission critical and approved by the governor's office. So every year we submit our blanket out-of-state travel request that includes any uh, meeting that's out-of-state. So it's always subject to approval to meet that standard. This one just requires an extra uh, approval because it is out-of-country. Okay. Madam Chair? Yes. Um, so let me ask this question. I mean, Clark was the one who chose, chose the location of this meeting. And are there other states that will be unable to participate because of because of where it's being located. I would imagine that there are. I, I don't have any kind of data on yeah, that. I, the I'm only sure. um, anecdotal data I have is pertaining to agenda item G and spoke to the EO of New York's uh, board, and he indicated that he was not going to be able to go to travel. <coughs> but so, we haven't done any kind of So I'm wondering then if, you know, as a representative board of Clark, we don't make any suggestion to them that then they offer up some kind of video conferencing ability, whether it be this meeting or future meetings, because if out state travel is going to be denied by other states, including California, which represents about 20% of their entire membership, um, I think that's something that they may, may wish to consider. Yeah, no, I, uh, I is, that, is that something that you could look into to, to I mean, I just think that they really should have some kind of webcast if they can. Um, at, at least the, the critical parts of it. Um, you know, they're, they've made major changes to their bylaws. I mean, major. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's kind of unfortunate that it's, you know, I guess the perfect storm. You know, they've made a lot of changes and then they have it in a location that that's going to be difficult to get approved. So, um, yeah, we could look into the webcast. I'd also like to know how many other states are having to win that helps our argument. Why did they pick Toronto? They're not controlling the license if they are I believe they have a member. Courtney, do they have a member board in Toronto? I so. Oh, that's yeah. why. Yeah. One yes. member? <laughs> no, they actually have, uh, they have like two, okay. three, three people that are running for the board as well. I'd just like to know how many other states are going to have us in the end. I would dare say we're not going to be right. If I could ask a follow-up question. <laughs> if this had not been in Toronto and we applied for out-of-state travel, would we still have been denied? Or is it because it is in Toronto that we would deny? In other words, let's say if it was in New York. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I've attended, I attended the one in Philadelphia, and um, we had um, someone attended Boise, Idaho last year. So. I went to Seattle. Right. So um, I know it's a year by year kind of kind of event. Is this a budgetary thing, or was it specifically because it was? It's, it's not a budgetary. It's um, it's you know, requires the governor's approval. Every year it's it's submitted, so there is the possibility of it not being approved. There also are restricted states that now are not allowed to participate in the meetings at those states, um, at their local in those states. So it's possible if it was in, say, New York, it's possible it might not have uh, received approval. And I know other um, architectural boards aren't able to attend our counterpart, which is NCAR, um, their annual meetings as well. I think New York indicated to Brianna that they're not allowed to attend. So what I would recommend is that you still collectively come up with your recommendation of the vote 
for the, the officers and the candidates that are running, and that could be done by a mail ballot. Right. And then on the bylaws, um, you know, it's in your packet, so if you had any issues with the bylaws, maybe you don't have any um, problems with the, the amendments that are made, and you have a support position on it anyway, you know, it might, uh, it might go through as it's been proposed. But um, I think Brianna did make the ask if anything was going to be video conference or webcast, and they said no. But we can make the ask if that's possible. Could they do it if some other states, you know, collectively, like you say, there's, you know, a large amount of states that can't participate? Is the board, has the board been approved to go to NCARP this year? Um, yes, they, they, well, let me think here. Every year it's different. So I know we had trouble last year because there was a meeting in Kansas and we weren't allowed to travel to Kansas. It, it seems that uh, Landscape has had more approval success than the board. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and and um, ours are zero um, costs because they're funded by NPAR. There's no cost to the board, but it, some of ours have been but we've had more approvals recently, so um, it's met the standard, the mission critical standard. We've been able to seek more approvals than we have in the past. And so, as this is an election year, we have a new governor that will be coming in in January. Uh, I believe it's January. Uh, so it's up to the actual sitting governor, so it can change next year. Sure. Thank you. I, I also wonder, I, I don't know what the application process is for out-of-country travel, and you said Brianna that it was denied. Is it a matter of approach on that? Can we, can we pitch the case that it is mission critical and that we're dues paying members? And is that all taken into consideration? Well, as Vicki said, the first attempt was that blanket uh, travel request. Okay, so that was what we just found out very recently that it was denied. So then we've been in contact with our budget office and they've given us other forms and sample memos that we would then uh, submit um, for a secondary review. And as Vicki said, that goes through several layers, but um, we're hoping that we can achieve it that way. Okay. Bylaws don't allow written comments. Wouldn't it be a great recommendation from this board to ask them to amend their bylaws to allow for written comments if a person can't be at the meeting? I would think that would help resolve uh, things. And your dues paying member and a voting member. And if you have other voting members, if you have some draft language you could submit, I would encourage you to ask those states to also support that change in their bylaws. It's, it's a good fix, and I think it's fair. Uh, we are not allowed to do anything unless we're physically at the meeting, not just vote, but we can't submit comments. And it is a substantial change. It's going to affect us. And I would just like really emphasize that because that would, I think, justify the attendance.
won the election uh, will be made at the annual meeting. So now we can certainly look through the attachments that are open to discussion. And we're asking that the committee uh, at today's meeting um, <coughs> make their selection on uh, determining who LATC would vote for in the election. I'd like to um, open it up for discussion. It's for me. It's kind of hard to um, talk about the elections of these individuals um, without talking about the um, all the changes that they've made to the bylaws. Um, so uh, I, one of the things that um, I thought was kind of large was the fact that uh, you know we, we no longer have three choices. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, one of the comments I was making. So they're they're asking us to vote on um, future people that will be on the board of directors for Clark, and then they're also asking us to in person vote on the bylaws that are changing. And there's um, some major changes to the bylaws. And I was just saying it's it's difficult to kind of separate out the two because they kind of get intertwined. Um, one of the things that caught my attention in reviewing all the documentation is that um, we will no longer have like regional representation. So in the past, the whole country in Canada, I guess, was divided into different regions, and we had representative from our region, um, which kind of helps because, you know, it's a smaller group of people, and, you know, you would know that person better. Uh, but one of, the, one of the changes is to get rid of that and to have representation um, on a national level, so to speak. So, um, and I thought our region was Region 5. Am I in the right on that? It is. Okay, I don't see anybody running for Region 5. Yes, we're not. It's we can't hear you guys? Region. Okay. So, it'll be next year that they would have Region 5. Okay, but we so won't. So, it's a two-year two period, yeah. So, if they yeah. don't have it, then we like won't. I was, I was alternate director of Region 5, but because they got rid of the regional, the alternate regional director position, I don't, it was a two-year position, and I only held it for one year. Okay. So, Oh, okay. Because I was noticing there's like Washington's the only state west of the Mississippi and Colorado, and I was kind of wondering. So it's because that those regions are this period and then two. Okay, yeah, it's rotation. Yeah. Um, so I uh, I think that I guess I'm just wondering how other people feel about that that change. If, if we could talk about it a little holistically, is that okay? So you want to move on to I point. Um, the bylaws? Well, how does the rest of the committee feel? Do you want to just go ahead and vote on uh, these individuals, or do you want to talk about well, the bylaws? Uh, I would say let's look at the whole thing you know, together, and then, and then we can kind of come back to that. Because how, how many of us know any of these individuals? Yeah. You know, I know maybe two yeah. out of my entire slate. Yeah. I, I guess, but it's, it's wow, well, it's, it's interesting. And, almost a little frustrating that we'll talk about the bylaws, but chances are we're not going to be able to provide feedback from what I can tell. Okay, so we will then move to I.3 and then come back to I.2, is what I'm understanding? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I.3, um, as discussed, is review and possible action on resolution to approve proposed amendments to the Clark bylaws. Um, in 2018, FAR released these proposed amendments, um, and as discussed, will be voted upon during the annual meeting in September. In some of their uh, publications, CLARC has expressed that the benefits of adopting these changes would be to um, ensure a continued relevancy, provide equal access to all board members, create opportunities for leadership, provide a wider variety of ideas, offer the ability to nominate for all positions and allow continuation of member services and opportunities. Um, encapsulated in this section, there's several attachments which Clark has provided to help explain 
uh, the bylaws, the first of which is a summary of changes. This is attachment one, and it um, summarizes the substantive changes to the bylaws. Um, there's also uh, attachment two, it, all, it encompasses all of the proposed changes to the bylaws in track changes and with comments explaining each of those changes. So attachment two is the extent of the changes they're proposing. Attachment three um, is the resolution and board of directors statement of support. Uh, and attachment four is uh, a resource document to aid uh, members in evaluating the bylaws. And then also attachment five is an FAQ. So considering all of this, at today's meeting, the committee is asked to review the proposed edits to Clark bylaws and take possible action. So the other um, big item that kind of jumped out at me um, as I was reviewing this information was um, that there's a lot more appointments and a lot less people that would be elected. Um, Might I make a comment on that? Yeah. I believe it's because they have, they're having difficulties finding individuals that would run for those offices. Yeah. Okay. So this way the be an appointed position by the president, I believe. And rather than having to go through an election process asking for nominees, so that way they would give they would basically pick individuals who were interested and try to seek them out. Because again, when we start taking a look at the, the ballot, the individuals that are that are represented here, all we have on most of them is just what's written here. Unless you know them personally, you have no idea of their qualifications. So uh, the president probably does know that these people would be able to make appointments to fill vacancies as they come up that are important to be able to run their organization. That's just my opinion. Yeah, another thing that I noticed is they've opened it up so um, it's the board is open to individuals that aren't fancy architects. So there's actually an attorney that's running as well. Um, any comments on that? I guess that could be a good thing too, right? <laughs> um, but you know, I, I you know it's a good point that you made um, about you know if they're having difficulty filling the positions and whatnot. Um, this I guess provides them a little bit more flexibility. Yes. I will note to what Andy was just discussing um, on attachment I 3.5 FAQ down in the first page. Uh, the last question says, so the recommendation is to move forward or move toward a hybrid board of directors. What does this mean? The answer to the first part of that says a hybrid board means that some members of the board would be elected by membership and some members of the board would be appointed by the board as recommended by the membership advisory. Regards to the voting, um, what page are you on? Okay, page 415. She's on attachment two. I'm sorry, I'm attachment. I thought it was three. Yeah, two. 415, section seven is voting. And mid parent third line, there shall be no proxy voting. Voting by, and then it crosses out letter, written ballot is permitted only for the election of officers. So that would be the part that we're looking at to have um, amended, right, by the telecast or, and I don't know what the language would be, would it be something, uh, I, don't, I just want to say webcast, you know, could Skype or what, you know, is it over medium, any social media, you know, whatever the way, it's the third, page 415, section 7, third line in the middle, there shall be no voting by proxy. The only thing is you can do the election. So that would be to me where we would uh, highlight that as uh, our comments. So I didn't think that you 
were suggesting that we um, that it was about voting, I thought we wanted to recommend that they um, provide some kind of webcast for portions of their meeting. Right. So I didn't know. That's the only one that I could find quickly. Uh -huh. Was because the, to me, the attending is one thing which we want, right. but voting is also because if they're going to vote on all this, to me, that's out of the important. Yeah. So there may be another chapter or another section in here where it would be appropriate to. Yeah. I was trying to quickly find any other ones. Yeah, because um, Andy, in the past, we we have voted um, prior to going to the meeting, right? Right, which we're going to do today. We're on, the vote people. on the on, on the individuals, but they in the past they've wanted for they wanted actual representation at the meeting for things like the Bible. Mm -hmm. So I guess they want you to have a little bit of skin in the game, so to speak. Yeah. So. I don't know if it's similar for CARB as it is for NCAR, but um, sometimes when NCAR has resolutions, they give you the proposed amendments. And then as they're reviewed and discussed in the regional meetings, that you know during the annual meeting, they break out in the regional meetings, they might come up with proposed amendments to the amendments. So then they bring it out to uh, the full uh, membership, and then they vote on whether or not to approve those amendments to the amendments. So in having your draft here, I don't know if CLARP also has that opportunity where maybe what you're looking at today might not be the final amendments that it will be voted on in the action, at the actual meeting. So that, that might be a consideration too. So if you're not there, be able to, to participate in the discussions as these proposed amendments are brought up from the floor, then you know, you're know not maybe voting on the exact same thing. Right. Yeah. Did, did you get a, the impression that this was kind of final? And, uh, I, no, I mean, certainly they have their statement of support and they are you know, recommending that this go through, but um, no, they are having the vote at the meeting, so I would say it's not final until then. There is something else to maybe note, that is Christine Anderson is president of CLARB and she has been chair of this committee and served on this committee for a number of years. So if we have any questions about it, we might want to contact her directly and I'm sure she would be happy to address any concerns we might have. Okay, if there, if there aren't any additional comments about I-3, then I guess we can go back to I-2 and um, make our recommendations. Well, do we want to vote for I-3 or? Also, uh, Susan has suggested potential language to that one section on the voting. We talked about why logistically uh, they don't want to allow for um, technology-based participation, which makes sense to me, but I don't think Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, so we can we can make this a motion. Do you want to make a motion? No, but Susan, I'm sorry, <laughs> Susan. Do you, after our discussion, do you feel better about allowing that voting bylaw stand and move through, or do you still have concerns? We're we're still going to go through this, right? Are we going to go through uh, item by page? By page? I don't know. Because you said something about are we ready to vote on um, Amendment 1.3? No, I was. I said 1.2. Oh, okay. I was yeah. Here. So. Okay. So you uh, have to go back. Right. So this would be. I did find another one up above on page four under section five, second paragraph, fourth line, says that. Um, know what laudatory resolution it says that not less than 60 days prior to the annual or special meeting so how can they come in with amendments at the meeting amendments to the amendment if everything has to be posted 60 days what well, well what I did say was that I don't know if Clark operates the same way as any part but I this when we have a resolution it's not always uh, voted on exactly how it was proposed so Amendments can come from the floor on resolutions. Sometimes they're defeated, but that happens. So I don't know if your organization allows that as well. Thank you. Does you know Clark allows amendments? I, I do not know. You 
don't know, Andy? I, I don't know if they, if they allow that or not. But again, I, I would suggest that we contact Christine Anderson directly. We have until September 21st, so we have almost two months until we are required to vote on this. Is that correct? Yes. That's my opinion. So, uh, One more comment regarding that. The third paragraph under the same section does say that uh, board of directors may offer resolutions to be presented. Amendments to resol resolutions may be presented at the meeting. So again, now we go back to our justification of why we included with another item here. But, um, so I, yeah, the 60 days would be now, wouldn't it? We at the 60 days before right now because it's September. Yeah, so we're just shy of the 60 days. So yes, I recommend that that's our uh, where I think it would fall in there about the teleconferencing.
um, travel to those particular states so that they would not be enjoying the benefits of Californians going there. Um, it is specifically for purposes of representing the state agency. Um, what I'm noticing is that I'm not, I'm reviewing this quickly, but I'm not seeing a ban on video conference representation. I see a prohibition on voting by proxy, okay. but I don't see where you can't <coughs> attend electronically. But they would have to, like how we're doing this, this meeting now, they would have to have that provision, correct? And that would be at a cost. I mean, they, it's something that they would be paying for from their, yeah. from their side of coordinating and setting this link. Absolutely. Or they could, um, I guess they could pass the cost on to the members that um, are trying to appear at the conference through video conferencing. Um, but what I'm hearing from you, you're speaking with Susan and I in this case, I don't see an opinion here that precludes us from participating via electronically I agree. if CLARP has provisions and infrastructure in place to allow it to happen based on your quick review. Right, I would, and that's what I would push. We can't get there in person. There is no prohibition or requirement for in-person attendance. It just says attendance, and it prohibits voting by proxy. So if someone is in attendance through video conferencing, um, they should make that available. I mean, I, I would push the point. Well, I feel better based on your quick review that we can yep. do what we need to, but we need to work with Clara to do it. Yep. yep. And, you know, if necessary, I think that's that's really where the other states come in. We already have a contract with New York. Perhaps we start, you know, forming a gang of video conference attenders and um, yeah, because request New York that we ever can attend. Mm -hmm. Because their state doesn't allow for that type of trip. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, all the more reason they have, you know, campus in that. So, Madam Chair, my next question is to Vicki and Brianna. Um, so if we can get them to do it, but it's going to cost us some funding to get it done. And I know, I'm guessing you don't have the final answer. What do you think bringing the tea leaves? Could we fund a component that allows us to purchase this? We, we have definitely the budget. Okay. If it were, there would be a cost, but it would be getting the approval to spend it on right. that particular. So it might involve a contract, which sometimes can take a little bit okay. of time to do, but it's doable. But I, I have a feeling you're not going to be able to convince them to do it. So we'll try. They might see it as a workaround. Yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll, we'll try and really push it, but I have a feeling that they'll, they'll not be flawed. I have another question. Um, so we can't, if we cannot be there to vote, it, I don't see anything in here that says that you are allowed to write written comments. Because that would be the only way is if you could submit written comments and the other people there to vote would see what our comments were, then that could help, you know, our cause to, um, and then you, you know, potentially could call New York or whoever and say, you know, do you support what we're saying? So you, you may, there may not be a provision to submit it to Clark, but there's probably nothing um, just allowing you to send your opinions to the other states that are voting, and they can consider yours when they, when they vote. So we cannot submit it directly to Clark. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying there may not be a provision that allows that process, but I don't think there's anything that would prohibit you from sending your opinion to the other states that are going to be there. Or send our opinion to Well, I, I don't think this is the first time we've seen, you know, we've seen markups. I mean, this has been this process has been going on for like a year. So it's not this this is not the first time we've seen the bylaws come through. We've been talking about this for, for a bit. So I think this is just their latest iteration of the bylaws with comments from all member boards who have made comments. 
and I believe we've probably submitted comments before. This is that this is like a final version, oh, yeah. and this is what they're looking to and incorporating all the different comments that they've received. And after you know a year of discussion, okay, this is this is where we are right now. Are you okay with what's being presented? I think that's kind of where we're at. To be honest with you. Yeah, it's it's pretty extensive. I know on our side. They always have amendments to the bylaws, but it might be only a couple of sections or a right. couple of um, amendments, but this is pretty extensive. So they probably have been working on this, like I said, for quite a while. Right. Okay, so, um, I, you know, I think that um, I'd like to have someone make a motion, unless Susan, do you have more comments? No, I was gonna make a motion, but I was gonna add to that motion about um, like send out letters to the other states or uh, however, we, if we can't be there, we have the vote today to authorize whoever to then provide any written comments of which the section seven voting, that would be part of our comments. Because we may not be able to teleconference to this one, but that would then get that elect part of this to then be able to view it the next time. Yeah. So is, is that part of the motion? Do I add that? Um, Go ahead and state the motion as you would like to see it uh, voted on, and then uh, we can have additional discussion if you know to tweak the actual wording. Okay, so <clears throat> there's not a pre-written motion on this, right? You're on Act One. Yeah. So I think three. Okay. Um, we just ask that the committee uh, review oh, there the proposed okay. uh, bylaws and take possible action. Okay, so I have a question before you move. Um, I'm looking at the last attachment, the last page. So it's attachment I three five. Very end. I three point five. Yeah. We welcome your questions and comments about the recommendations. And this is who you can contact. Can you lay out your concerns and send it in here? Do it this way. Where were where were you That's that was kind of, I didn't know who, but that was part of my motion is uh, yeah. who should I contact if I have questions is where pretty much the answer is, right? Yeah. So Perhaps you could uh, come up with a, your top list of grievances with the bylaws. Um, approve a, a motion to submit those concerns to these individuals on behalf of the committee. Okay, so I and I was thinking probably of... authorize your uh, interim executive officer to uh, massage the language just for. Purpose of yeah, that's brevity at this meeting. Okay. okay, so let's see if I can do this. Um, so I make a motion that the committee, uh, I make a motion that the committee grant the authority to our delegated representative to finalize a letter, uh, to make comments, and or attend the meeting. And then give them the discretion of it, you know if they have to make a change, right? Because we can't vote on all of it if they make a change. And then also that we, as part of the motion, that the letter, our comments be put in the letter and be submitted to the three people listed under the question queue. Also uh, to all the states. Um, that's the motion. Is that a sufficient motion? <laughs> oh, and then, the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and that with the emphasis on uh, Section 7 under voting <clears throat> and Section 5 regarding resolutions and other motions. I, it seems like those are the two areas. We've got a big motion going here. Sorry. Maybe we should we we break it into like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so maybe, maybe one, you know, talking about being able to participate um, remotely. Okay, well let's start with the motion allowing the chair or our representative mm -hmm. to okay. be making, writing a letter and or uh, being at the meeting and the ability to vote 
which may mean changing right now. I'm kind of getting her books, but so let's go back. The motion would be to authorize our representative to make a letter and or attend the meeting and authorizing them to, you know, to make decisions. Is that, does that help? Okay, so that's the first motion. Second. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, do we need to, as a committee, discuss this anymore? We're open to the public comment. Oh, yeah. Promotion, uh, right? Promotion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, any comments from the public? It was a little confusing when you said, if you can't attend, then you can submit written comments. Is that what your motion yeah. is? Great. And or, so so I want an end or. Oh, in addition to. So if you're going to attend, you can still send comments. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. The okay. The authorization is that we're authorizing our delegate to, today we're not going to go line item by line item. So I wanted to make the motion that we are authorizing our delegate to then be making those decisions, like on the fly at the meeting or whatever it needs to be. Okay. Uh, can I clarify the delegate? Was it that on? You're saying so if we do get attendees at the meeting, so that would be classified as the delegate? Yeah, I guess, or the voting member. I'm not, I don't know what to call them. <laughs> Delegates. Delegates, okay. Okay, any, any other comments before we vote? Christian Trout. Aye. Mark Truscott. Aye. Andy Bowden. Aye. Susan Landry. Aye. David Allen Taylor Jr. Aye. Carries four zero. Five. Five zero. Thank you. Five. <laughs> Good four. <laughs> okay. So Does anybody else want to make a motion? I don't want to use it. Talk all this way. Okay. Okay. So let's see if I can do this one right. Um, so I make a motion that we provide comments either prior a letter and or attendance regarding section 5 resolution and other motions and section 7 regarding voting to allow participation via do I use the word technology Skype remote I think um, digital to have digital representation remotely yes yeah. Okay. Um, any more discussion on that item? Oh, one thing. Do I need to add the people's names of who we're going to say is that the third motion? Well, you, you said that on your first motion. The three people listed. Okay. Yeah. Well, you had me re-say the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't say that in the redo of the motion. So if you, if you limit it to the three, do you not want to go to other states? Well, that's why I'm asking. Was that part of my first motion? So that's not the first. First. No, it's not the first. first motion. It was revised entirely so that technically the new first motion was just to authorize the delegates, uh, delegate to uh, create a letter and or attend um, and make decisions on the committee's path. This one is now specifying particular comments to be highlighted in the letter. Um, and you could say the letter or um, and or the attendant com uh, comment um, to uh, highlight these things, but in the letter in particular, send it to the individuals in the state. Okay, so that okay, okay that's so the, the like my motions. <laughs> can we can we? So is the the comments going to be to? Revise section five and seven to allow that digital presentation or participation. Okay. <coughs> so, do I need to restate the motion? Let's go ahead and do that. Okay. Okay. So, I make a motion that our, I guess we're calling it delegate, specifically address section five and section seven regarding remote access digital technology whatever and that that 
letter comment would be distributed to the three people listed on the last page and to all states as deemed appropriate, or just all states. Oh, and out of country because we got people in Toronto. <laughs> okay, so let's say instead of all states, all members. All region. What? Member board. Member board. Board member. Okay. Member board. Okay. I just want to make sure because I'm yeah. right trying to hear well, right? Right. Um, did you include the written letter and attendance? I said and or attendance. Okay. Yeah. Because you told me what that means. <laughs> Both. <laughs> any, any comments from the public? Any additional discussion? Patricia Trow? Aye. Mark Prescott? Aye. Andy Bowden? Aye. Susan Lambert? Aye. David Allen Taylor Jr.? Aye. Patricia Perry's? Aye.
Okay, I was just curious. Okay. So I seconded the motion. So um, I guess I'd like some clarification in the end. So uh, Mr. Region two and region four. We don't. We don't. Vote we don't vote on those. We're not. We're not in those regions. Just wanted to. Wanted to um, make sure I understand that. So region right. two will vote for region two and region four will vote for region four. For at least for the next year. For, the, for yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Any public comment? Susan can't make the September 12th board meeting. Did you guys hear that? 
No. Uh, I don't have a calendar with me yet. So I would like to know if we want a second person as the backup in case I find out tonight or tomorrow that I can't attend the September 12th meeting. I'm pretty sure I can, but just in case as a backup. So I think Andy already said he has he's out of town. Yeah. So. I'm out of town, but I could truck I could possibly be up there. So in San Francisco. In San Francisco. So and it's only I, under the if I, I go and the, find out I'm not yeah, going to I could be the open. Okay. 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 And if, I mean, if it doesn't work out for Andy, I, I can go. Okay, one and alternate two. Right. <laughs> I, you know, also I can cover that too. Okay, so. Uh, there's plenty of resources. I would draw my. Okay. I would draw my. Okay. Oh, we have so many people. So, Amy, Meeting, Mighty Mo, David, or Mark? Whoever can Well, since I'm up in the north, why don't I recommend that I go alternate? Okay. Makes sense. Very yeah. That yeah. makes sense. Okay. okay. So. Um, so is everyone available the 8th and 9th of November? Yes. Yes. We can send out a doodle poll to the uh, yeah. property when everyone has their knowledge. I'm just concerned if we don't try and do it now and get the I can do it the 8th of November. If we could have it, we not have it on the first day of So I can't get my yeah, We did the Friday. We are going to have a standard meeting, yeah. though. Yes. So Monday yeah. should be the planning the next day, or vice versa, if we have the standard meeting. Well, usually it's a standard meeting first, and then we Right, right. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> eight, eight and nine is good yeah. for everyone? Yeah, it yeah. looks like yeah. so far, yeah. Experience, uh, especially in consideration of the experience only pathway. So, 
what we presented at that meeting was um, an updated current iteration of the form because when we reviewed it, we identified that some of the information uh, requested on the form was extraneous to what our regulatory authority is to collect information. So we streamlined the form, we presented that as the current, and then using that as a template, we presented um, proposed changes to, uh, requested of 2020 to those amendments to expand the pathways to become promulgated. Um, so the committee reviewed this form. Um, the first uh, first uh, direction to staff was to change references on the form to no longer say landscape contracting, but change it to landscape construction. So you have that shown in attachment one. I went ahead and did that. Um, and then secondly, the committee, um, we had also provided verification, experience verification forms from other states. And um, in review of these forms, uh, the committee requested that staff go back to the office and conduct some additional research to see if we could expand the information collected on our form to match what those other states have. We looked at a few states that had um, quite a bit of um, variety of experience so that it's delineated on our form on their forms including also some of them have uh, supervisors rating and so we wanted to see and new york and washington are specific, specifically named um, we wanted to see what authority they had to do that and is that something that we could then match so in doing so we put the po progress on 2620 and 2615 on hold um 2615 was on hold because the committee board voted to present them to OAL in a joint packet um, because based on the research it could be determined if um, more uh, changes are necessary to the language. So um, staff went back to the office, we decided to pass a wider net than just New York and Washington. Mm -hmm. We identified 10 states that um, have both an experience only pathway and verification for experience verification forms that have um, a lot of criteria on it, like a lot of areas where a candidate could get experience. And we reached back to them with a questionnaire, uh, basically asking what's your authority to, to collect it, and then asking about their procedures as well for reviewing an application um, for a candidate. And you know, do, do they require diversified experience and what is your procedure in doing so? So we received responses, both via email and, and on the phone from all um, 10 states. Um, Attachment two um, is a summary of some of those responses. We, we encapsulated attachment two to just these five because really we found that all ten um, had very similar answers in that in summary, uh, these states that do have a lot of information on the form do not have it in their array um, grantee authorizations require it. <coughs> so um, what we have is we singled out five states that we so pretty much encapsulate the data that we collected as a whole. Um, but, and I should request that I just go ahead and um, review two of them. Um, New York and Oregon, I had the pleasure of, they submitted an email response, and then um, I had the pleasure of speaking to their leaders on the phone a little bit further. So looking at attachment two, um, some of the research that we obtained is that New York, while, and, and by the way, the way that we formatted this attachment is um, a summary of the information we obtained from the state is the first page, and then the following page is their form for them. So, though New York does have on um, their form various um, practice areas where a candidate would get their experience, they do not have it in their way mandating that a diversity of that experience or variety is necessary. Um, notably, what they do have is on the second page of their form, there's rating areas where the supervisor would rate um, excellent, satisfactory, marginal, unsatisfactory on basically how they did. Um, and the EO explained to me that they have a regulation that points to um, experience satisfactory to the board and they feel that they can extrapolate that <coughs> to um, say, okay, you know, if, if a supervisor rates a candidate as unsatisfactory, then that's reason enough to deny that experience. Um, however, there is still an appeal process in place, and the appeal process generally is sending it to the board for further review. So that's a brief um, summary of New York. And then the other one that we wanted to point out is Oregon, because we have the pleasure of speaking to their EO as well. And, um, 
What was interesting in these, this finding was um, that while Oregon does have quite a few areas where a candidate would get their experience, um, the EO pointed out that they actually went through this drill very recently themselves, and um, they reached out to CLARB, identified a number of areas um, based on the where where they could um, incorporate uh, experience areas on their form. However, they realized when it came down to operationalizing them, how they would weigh it, what kind of variety they would necessitate a candidate to get, they realized it would become subjective and therefore decided to just rely on the layer as being the um, layer of someone's ability to uh, perform and that they left these areas on the form, their experience form rather, um, as a guide for candidates to see where they could get their experience. Mm -hmm. So those, but really, as I said, um, the five states that we have noted in here are all come back with, they don't have their uh, authority in their regs, nor do they have their procedures in their regs. So nothing available that we could then mimic for ourselves. So that was that finding. We also decided to do some additional research internally because we decided to look at what data do we have that closely matches this proposed experience only pathway. So experience only pathway, we're proposing it, someone will get six years of experience to qualify for licensure. The closest that we have for that is someone who has a one year education credit and that would be an associate degree in the landscape architecture program and uh, as a 2012 in architect degree. So those candidates qualify with one year of education credit and then they then have to get five years of experience. So they're the closest that we've got that we could see and make a comparison. So what we decided to do is going back to 1998 when LATC became LATC, we pulled, I'm going to say we, staff did a great job pulling um, all the files to see, okay, which candidate uh, qualified and then we then looked at their um, their exam scores. We looked at what kind of experience they gained to see if we could identify a trend in the experience. And then those licensees that were identified, we looked at their enforcement records to see if there was any indication of this group was having complaints or enforcement action. Um, we identified 30 <coughs> candidates and licensees, and I believe 16 of this group were licensees, 22 are active candidates. Um, and so we, like I said, looked at the following data. Some of it is charted on this cover sheet. What you have <coughs> on the blue and green chart of the cover sheet is um, examination data finding. So the top line under exam type is CSV. So for all 38 licenses and candidates that we identified, um, we saw that 17 have, um, or rather, no, I apologize, 17 for the list. For the CFC, this encapsulates all the 30 that we identified. There's been 19 attempts by this group to take the CFC. 15 um, instances were they passed, uh, equating a pass rate to 79%. Then, um, even though we collected data back to 1998, we also wanted to do um, chart the layer of data to see how they did on the layer. We used for this, and, and this only encapsulates 17 licenses candidates because we wanted to use the most current iteration of the layer. Um, so that way you see the green column, we can compare it to all of California and how California does. So um, you'll see in the blue column the pass rate um, for the layer sections for our group of candidates and licensees that we pulled um, versus all of California. We did this to show as a, a reference that, you know, yes, it's a little bit less their, their, their pass rates are a little bit less than the all of California candidates, which by the way includes the, the candidates who have four-year LAAB accredited um, degrees. Um, but it's not too far off base, and really the caveat that we want to express is this is just for a reference because it's the best that we can show, but this isn't apples to apples data. Um, it's definitely apples to oranges because we have such a small group that we pulled that if one person um, had a difficult time with the exam, it's definitely, definitely going to skew the data uh, much more than it would for the all of California population here. So again, it's just a snapshot reference that we can do. Um, and then we looked at the experience gain to see what kind of trends those were. We saw preliminary drawings, draft, design, construction documents, planting, irrigation, and project management. 
seem to be the topmost um, that were gained by those with the 38 candidates in the community. And lastly, in reviewing the enforcement records, we determined that there were no enforcement actions um, taken against the licensee to qualify for licensure in this, in this pathway. So like I said, again, the purpose of this research is just to give a general idea. Um, we wanted to just inform you as best as we can in making this decision. So all together, we ask that you um, consider the handout with the, the language. Um, the proposed uh, certification of jury form in S1, the data presented, and we also included for your reference the bar employment verification form as attachment three. Um, and we ask that the committee review all this in totality and take possible action. <laughs> okay. Quick question on the chart. <clears throat> it has to do with one year of education credit. Is that in state education or anywhere that they had a one year? Anywhere. So any state. Do you know how many of these received it from in California? We did not pull that data. We only pulled um, their, their exam and enforcement and experience data. Because that to me would be interesting if this particular year had a high number of people that got their education in state versus maybe other years where there was like one year but it was an out of state if their pass rate would have been that high. Well, we went back to 1998. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and then in this table um, with the layer exam data, that's only reflected on 2012, so now, but still several years. So the 19 attempts is 19 people or? It could have been someone who took it a couple of times. One and one, mm -hmm. yeah, because then that would make a difference. Okay. Yeah. Courtney might have. Uh, an idea if the AA degrees or the architect um, degree was out of state or California, do you kind of have a sense from looking at them? Because didn't you do the research on this or did Blake? Um, I think the majority of them were California, but off the top of my head, I don't want to commit anything. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Um, so at our last meeting, we, um, you know, we started to discuss the, the form, and um, so you know, it's it's, um, it's good to see um, the various forms that the different states are currently using. Um, I'll just kind of open it up for discussion. So. Um, I think, you know, part of this discussion is kind of based in two parts. One is we have uh, people who are trying to uh, gain their experience and they have education behind them. So and this is the form that we've been using up to this point and that's been serving well. And, and I don't have a problem with that for that particular group. It's the new pathway that we've opened up where it's experience only with no education. And I think that's where we're trying to get this additional information to understand if they're, you know, their qualifications to be able to sit for the exam. Understanding that the, the layer exam and the CSE will still be the gatekeepers as to whether or not they get a life, but we're now just trying to get to that point as to their qualifications to be able to, be able to sit for the exam. So, uh, and that's where I think that we were, at least from my standpoint, I was trying to get a little bit more information on the form, um, because right now, and again, looking at the same form that we've, that we've been using, um, all it basically is is that you've got a very small little box that is completed by a candidate, and then you have the section two, which is the super, supervisory certific certification, certification completed by the supervisor, which really just only has four boxes to check, you know, landscape architecture, architecture, civil engineering, and now landscape construction, and you sign your name and date it, and Bob Jones will you that. And to me, that just doesn't seem to be enough. I mean, for the, yeah. for the pathway, when it's experience only, well, what kind of experience have they received I mean, that, that qualifies them to be able to sit for the exam? So that's, that was my whole point of, you know, 
know, going through this exercise and trying to find out what other, what other states have done. And I can fully appreciate that they may not have it, uh, the other states may not have it written into their legislation um, or regulations to be able to require some of this information, but I still think that it's worthwhile information to have. Uh, it gives them an idea of the, the kinds of experience and knowledge, skill, knowledges and skills that they should possess to be able to sit through their exam. The other thing is, and, and now I'm going kind of way back, and Mark will you know, have an understanding of this because he was there with me when we were going through this, but when it was the State Board of Landscape Architects and we were going through the sunset review, this was one of the items that we were getting dinged on, mm -hmm. was that we had a pathway which was experience only, and we had poor tax rates. And so that was one of the things that I think that the legislature was looking at <clears throat> when they ended up sunsetting. It was kind of like, well, you know, your pass rates are so low, you know, and we tried to explain, well, gosh, we, we have these other pathways, and yeah, they, they, they're not gaining that knowledge and skills through education. They're gaining, you know, there's a pathway that is experience only, and that could be dragging down the score. Of course, at that time, we didn't have the AXP or Breeze or anything else to be able to really have that information readily available. Um, so anyway, that, that was the story behind that. And that's the reason why is I just am trying to avoid having that comment come back again at another sunset review where they say, how come your test scores are so much lower? Mm -hmm. And I know we've talked about this and we talk about it probably every single meeting where we say, well, we have multiple pathways that other states don't have, we have a diverse population. And yeah, well, that's all great and wonderful to say. And so a legislator says, you know, I think that we're going to need to eliminate the LATC because there's really no need to have licenses. That's the fear. So, I mean, we're here to protect the public. And I just want to make sure that, I mean, it doesn't, it, maybe it's just me being naive, but I just, I, I don't see it as that big of a deal to fill up the rest of the bottom of this page with just by saying, oh, and by the way, tell us what experience areas that you, you obtained during, you know, during the, the six years that, you, that you're saying that you've been doing. So that, that's what I'm trying to say. Maybe I've not stated it well enough, and, but that, that was my intent. Yeah, so, um, you know, just to, just to give the, the public a, a little more background as well, in a perfect world, we would have CARB taking this on because MCARB has this whole internship program that they manage, but CARB is not willing to do that. And, um, you know, I think that we obviously still need to make decisions on a state-by-state -state level, but um, I think that we need to start to have some communication going with CARB. Um, I um, had Brianna do a little more research, and there's actually 29 states now out of 50 that have a pathway with that, that's experience only. So in my opinion, it's time that we have something that's more formalized. And, you know, I think that, um, I think that it, California, we're a, a large mass of landscape architects. I, need, I think we need to take a leadership role and I think we need to contact them and start to push them in that direction. We wrote a, I wrote a letter what, last, last summer or something, but um, you know, I think we need to make it real clear to them that this is an important thing. That being said, we still need to reach an agreement on a form. And you know, I mean, after looking at these, I think you know, one of them that, in my opinion, tends to be a little more um, comprehensive is New York State. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, you know, one of the other things, too, that I think might be nice, I, I get um, correspondence from CLARB on various staff people that have worked under me. And so I fill out the form separately from them. And, you know, this is the situation where they fill it out and then, oh, here, can you, can you fill it out for me? And I'd, I'd like, like it to be a separate process so that, you know, the person the, um, that's reviewing this applicant's performance, you know, can do it privately. So, um, so anyhow, you know, I, uh, that's kind of where I stand on it. I think, I think New York is pretty good, but I want to hear from somebody else. I, 
I don't believe that we have anything in our past that would allow us to, if someone has an unsatisfactory <coughs> ranking, would allow us to preclude them from sitting for the exam once we start para. But um, so we have that to accept. Um, but I don't think it's a bad idea to have additional information that we can start pulling together data on our candidates so that we can look for trends so that we can make tweaks and changes. Um, and I do fully support the concept of pushing the bar towards something more formalized. I think that's what we really, really need. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also very concerned about um, if, if if a candidate has maybe only two experiences and they have the all the time that they need, and one of their experiences is with uh, an employer who doesn't like them, <laughs> and you know, so I, I don't want to weigh that, but we can't weigh them. That can't be a factor right now. The way things, so I'm, so I'm very sensitive to that. So if someone doesn't like someone and they mark unsatisfactory. Yes, they have all their hours and they can sit for the exam. I want to make sure that that doesn't come into play. Yeah, but as Karen has already said and spoken, so that we, uh, we, you know, we yeah. don't know the answer. But, but I think it's, I, I really, I fully support the concept of expanding our form to have these skills identified and, and for data, but that Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, along with that, I'm kind of in alignment too. And I think because it, as it stands, the supervisor or supervisor don't have to think about it. They can just, here you go. Whereas if you get some categories in there, it really makes them take the time to go, okay, what is this person truly experiencing? And while that can't stop them from sitting from the exam, it helps the supervisor at least, and it provides a record. For what it's worth, I don't, I don't know exactly, but I think it just helps inform both the supervisor, helps inform the, 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 I just think it's good information to have. Mm -hmm. yeah. It helps inform all that yeah. these are the skill sets that you need to have to be successful with this exam, and that helps from an educational point of view. That's a good thing. I agree. Yeah. So, one, one of the things that, well, I guess this is for, for Tara. So right now there's nothing in the regulation that that says we can or cannot change the form, right? We have to have a reason to be able to change the form. So okay, the so the form needs to reflect the regulation. Okay. And right now, the regulation does not authorize us to ask about all the different types of experience but we obtain. But, but we are changing. We're creating a new pathway. We are that? doing that, but in order to ask those questions, what kinds of experience are you obtaining, and perhaps how well you're doing at obtaining those skills, requires us to have data upon which to base those questions to put it in the regulation. If we don't have anything to go on, it's not going to be approved, and we're going to waste more time trying to get an experience-only pathway to get people licensed, to get more people out there. So, um, one thing we looked at in you know, all of this research was, okay, so everybody else is asking these kinds of questions, like they're looking for a particular skill set. Um, I looked at the layer. I saw that you know, they've got it broken up into different categories. All right, so what does that look like in this regulation? You would require diversified experience to be obtained. The candidate would have to qualify for diversified experience. Then we'd have to list all the different areas of what that diversified experience looks like. And then what do we do? How do we measure it? Do they have to get five out of 10 or seven out of 10 or all 10? What if they can't do all 10? We start creating even more barriers to licensure and we have nothing to base that on. We don't have any other states that have regulatory authority to do it. We don't have any data from other states about why those that list of qualifications is necessary just to take the examination. So we're going to be sitting in the same position. We have nothing to base it on. My opinion would be is to go with what we have 
right now. What you approved with 2620 and 2615 last time, which just creates the pathway, um, requires the experience to be obtained in one of four areas, require the supervisor to sign off on it, stating that yes, they obtained this type of experience under me, landscape contract, uh, construction, you know, et cetera. Then once we have some time with this experience only pathway, then we can start collecting data to see, all right, is this working? Are they actually prepared enough to take the exam successfully? If not, then we've got our data. And also, you know, enforcement actions. Has any consumer been harmed by the experience only pathway applicants? Um, that's when we can really justify asking for more information, but today we don't have it. Tara, how many years do you think of data? I mean, five years of data? I think five would be good, but I know that this is like a really tenuous situation, you know, I think probably around three to four years you'd want to start, you know, taking a hard okay. look at this stuff. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good moment. <laughs> um, so if I look at the other states and what they ask is construction documents design. So when I look at our test plan content that is online, and I look at our resource list and why California has its own test. We have our own test because we have irrigation, fire, ADA, Title 24, the MILO, and all that stuff. But on these other ones, that's nothing of the criteria because there's the deconstruction, deconstruction drawing. And so to me, if we do go with this experience only, it's not just did you do construction drawings in Tennessee, it's more like how does your experience relate to the things that we're studying. And you look at your list here, fire, uh, highway design, zero state, ADA compliance, all these things that are specific to California. To me, that's where we should be saying, okay, you passed the main exam, now you're passing California. That then should narrow down to what is different, right? So that, that's kind of my first comment. And then the second one under the self-certification, I will certify that work under me under my license. And one of the check boxes is landscape architecture. Okay, well, if you're self-certifying yourself to tell me that you're qualified, how can you already be a landscape architect? So what is the definition of under the category of landscape architecture? So if I'm a designer, do I check that box? And is that a state? Because it does list above what state. So to me, under self-certification, for you to sit for the exam, but you're, like, if you're an architect, it should be in California. If you're a contractor, it should be in California. And then how does that go to these different categories? Right, because you can't call yourself a landscape architect. Well, so if you're certifying yourself, how does that really do? Well, that part is also because this form takes a rest of candidate, too. So for someone who is licensed in another state, to say that they have the they are yeah. landscape. Yeah, they're not saying landscape architecture, they're yeah. landscape architecture. And do we have that defined somewhere? Well, okay, so this form mirrors the regulation, and the regulation that you've created here authorizes experience obtained under the direct supervision of or um, of, a, of a landscape architect licensed or registered in the jurisdiction where the experience occurred, hold on, or from um, another jurisdiction where you are currently licensed or registered. So they're self-certifying that I, I've worked this long in this state and um, I am licensed or registered in that state. So on some level we have um, history on this person to see whether or not they've got any enforcement actions against them. They're also saying that this is the work that I've done. If they're not prepared for the exam, that's on them to study to figure out what they're missing and then if they're failing these exams, we can take a look at it. We can correct it later to help these candidates be more successful. Today the problem is 
there's a barrier to licensure because people in other states can't come here uh, because they're going to have to go back to school. They're going to have to drop their job, stop paying you know, their way, and go back to school to meet California's criteria. It's, it's, <coughs> it's a statewide push to eliminate barriers for licensure. That's, that's a big directive that's going on right now. Um, at the same time, we have to justify asking the questions requiring them to lay out what kind of experience particularly and on what basis. Um, we don't have anything we can do that with right now. I mean, I, I, so if we, if we decide to go with something like the New York State form, are you essentially telling us that AOL will kick it out? If you go with the form yeah. and not attempt to put it in regulation, the form itself is going to be an underground regulation. It will be challenged in court because we're asking things that we don't have authority to do. We don't have authority to receive the information. Candidates don't know how their applications are being graded by staff. Staff won't know what they're supposed to do with the information. So we're collecting information that we don't lawfully have uh, a reason to collect and nobody knows what the standard is for evaluating the information. So effectively we're just confusing the matter. So it kind of sounds to me as though we're, whether we like it or not, we're kind of stuck with the form we have. And other than this one minor change of changing it from landscape contractor to landscape construction. If, if I may, um, in the short term, yeah, it creates the easiest path for us to clean up our language, provide the pathway, and move forward where, paraphrasing what you said before, where we can start collecting the data of the candidates who come through this pathway and then we can act in conceptually three to five years. If necessary. If necessary. If we identify the problem that, you know, we need more information. Um, or we need um, the regulation to lay out what kind of experience needs to be obtained, <coughs> then we'll have the basis for it. Because then, at that point, it'll be clarifying for the applicant, and we'll also need to specify how staff will evaluate that information. So if I be back to what you just said, we would need to work on the regulations first, but then work on the form, right? Yeah, there's no reason to work on the form if we don't have the regulations. Then it's hard. Strategic planning is in November, whatever date we pick. And then is that the time to then be looking at updating things for the regulations? Well, you're updating this regulation right now, and there are people waiting on this thing. And the board is now aware that this proposed regulation has hit some more trouble and it's almost like they're willing to take it back from you guys <laughs> to get this thing moving. So right now is the time to propose amendments, move the rulemaking package, right. however you guys decide. As far as the strategic planning, this will already have been done, okay. presumably. And there's the as well. Ah, okay. And so today, there's no necessary reason to go through the form. We, it's more looking at the regulation change, right, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, I mean, the form was important because it revealed that, oh, we don't have, we're not asking them to lay out what kind of experience they got. So that created the question, uh-oh, well, how are we going to evaluate these candidates? Well, it has to be in the regulation. Right. So I have a question. Um, so I, I brought the, um, the CAD form that we had available last um, the last meeting. So is there a problem with using what they're using? I don't have we that. We have it um, passed out and that's what we did. Okay. But our language would have to support that request. Well, in CAP form, presumably, I mean, are they using any carb internship ex ex program? I mean, um, they've got a different scenario than you guys do. Right, but they are asking more information than than what we have in our form. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> we we can 
not after that, what's the different experience there? Can we somehow footnote or asterisk each of these and say experience might may include and is, is not exclusive to and then list out these categories as just informational? Yeah, we can have an information sheet that goes with the form that says, you know, uh, the layer test B, um, I mean, yeah, we could change that. I mean, I want to make sure that this isn't something that we have to keep going back right. and revising every time, you know, the layer is updated. But um, with the form itself, as long as the questions required to be answered reflect the regulation itself, we're fine. But the, an informational page could say, um, these are the skills that you should yeah. teach to build in. So like for instance, just taking landscape architecture, you could have a footnote one or it could be an asterisk and then stuff, you know, somewhere on the form it says experience gained in this, under this top, this title or whatever, may include grading, um, construction administration, so on. And, but you know, you're not limiting to that, but you're pointing out something similar to what's already I probably would really want to for. ask for it because then it starts to look more like a requirement. Yeah. Okay. If we could just say, you know, the application is to take the examination, um, the examination to test these subjects. Well, they have it's to, more like that. Mm -hmm. They have the test plan with the um, KSAs already as a resource to know the areas that when they did the occupational analysis it was determined those are the areas that are um, being performed in the practice so the they can do yeah but, yeah but the employer or the supervisor who review it looking at this form i think it's healthy or helpful to remind them what what those ksas are or well, it might be pretty extensive, and then would you do it for more than one profession on there? Would you yeah, do it for all of them? Well, again, I'm not saying it needs to be, we could never be completely comprehensive on it. So it would be, you know, however we want to say it, may include, but it's not limited to. Well, again, how are we going to um, set out what civil engineering or even architecture requires. I mean, we need to focus it on what the examination test because this is a form to apply to take the exams. We want them to be successful on those exams, not necessarily successful in the work that they just completed to take the exam. I mean, we want them skilled. Mm -hmm. We want them to hit the ground running so that when they're providing services to consumers in California, they know what they're doing. Um, at the same time, we need to be careful about what requirements we're, we're getting from candidates and how we word these forms because we, we don't want to set up a situation where the supervisor is reading the form and says, oh crap, well, I didn't have to do any of this stuff. Well, I'm not going to sign it. Because, you know, I have to certify under penalty of perjury that, and I'm reading this form to mean that this is the stuff you should have been doing to qualify under this checkbox. That's going to be, you know, prohibitive. But we could inform that these are the subject areas that are being tested in each scenario. So I think at that point, you know, we are trying to be helpful to remind the supervisors that this is the, this is the expertise they need to be giving. Um, to Sorry, that's kind of where I'm going to. So however we can do that, whatever way that it's going to create. Heartburn? Or heartburn or, or, or get us in trouble. If or get the form kicked back. If, right. I, if I might make a, you know, a suggestion, in order to kind of kick this camp down the, down the road, I mean, get it, get this thing moving, I would suggest that we approve the form as it states now. So the pathway then is open, everything is, is going, and then we can come back and revisit it, you know, later on. Because I, I still don't feel comfortable with this form. I think the form basically says, now, basically all it says is that, yeah, I, I certified this person was employed by me from here to here. That's basically all it says. 
So yep. it does specifically say that the experience gained was in one of those four right, well, areas. But yes, but so that they are saying that. They right. are certifying that the experience was gained in those areas. In, in one of those areas. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, or, or yeah. 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 But that's what you've been allowing yeah. Yeah. already for, say, the five years of experience that we are in, so we did all the research on. So five of those years, that's how they've been reporting. But one year was in education, and you would think that in, you know, while they were being educated, they were possibly getting exposed to some of those, those areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we've always kind of been promoting, is that mm -hmm. that's why education, we feel, was so important. You know, we, that out of necessity, we've created this new pathway and now it's just trying to make sure that the, that the people that are going to be coming through are exposed to those areas. But I, I don't want to beat a dead horse. I mean, it, it sounds like at least the way things are at the moment that, we, that the form as presented is, is what needs to be approved so we can open the pathway. Because we're not doing anybody any favors by continually you know, talking, talking, about, uh, talking about this without having data to be able to support it. So my suggestion then is if, you're, if you entertain a motion, I, I would move that we accept attachment D.1 as presented. Oh, oh, um, I just want to remind you that the regulation package itself is on hold. So um, if you're fine with the form and fine with the language that you approved at the last meeting, can we also take the hold off of the package and set it on to the board for review? Uh, I'll amend my my motion. Oh, that was the motion. That was. That was um, do I wait well, to we, make a motion? We need a second, then we can make comments. I'll second his motion. What is how is the motion again? To accept the attachment G.1 as presented. And then does it go with what you well, just said? I was just getting ready to do that. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. So I'd like to amend my my motion to accept the uh, proposed language in uh, 2620 education and training credit. Um, and 2615 uh, form of examination and with that attachment G.1 uh, which is the uh, supervisory certification. I'm going to sign the file. Okay. Okay. Now, now, open it to public? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 You have the CARB employment certification form also in your um, Backup. And am I right or wrong? Um, once the California review occurs, does it go on to CLARM to have a final okay on taking the layer, or does it happen the other way around? There is not. This CLARB employment verification form has a lot of the things that you all have been talking about. And do applicants, if they don't have a state licensing board, go to CLARB? Or when does this kick in? When do they fill this in? They can. It can be both. Um, so we, we do get those forms. However, we are only able to um, process them or uh, pull the information, the same information that we pull that we collect on our own form. So when we look at someone's council record, we're only looking to confirm that the um, supervisor was licensed, we confirm the supervisor status, and we confirm or and, and we take um, the date. But we don't we don't. Um, verify that the, the base, you know how they're, they're able to select different areas. Project is construction, yeah. site design, and the time we that. How many have a straight report? Sorry. It might be around 50%. Then they're asking the same questions on the CLARB. Uh, uh, and you're accepting them. Kind of I know, yeah. but yeah. you're accepting them directly rather than you're going, or do they have to then go through the... It's just that we, we can only, that, that form does collect the same um, information that our form collects, so we can only uh, use the, the information that is available on that form that matches what That matches what? Yeah, and, okay. and, and for our evaluation. Because you do with that form, because I've seen that form, yeah. you, they ask you to evaluate. Yeah, it's in the packet and it goes into a lot more detail, which yeah. you all have collected, but do you but record it? That's for the exam, right? That's for the 
they're, they're just one. So you can either go directly to LATC, fill out the form, and sit for the exam, or you can go through CLAR, yeah. get there, or whatever it is, and then they send it off to the state, and then, then you're qualified. Yeah. Yeah. But I believe when you go through CLAR, you're opening up a council record. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's what that form is for, for opening a council record. And, and Courtney, if I'm correct in understanding you, all the information that you collect is the information that you need to fill out the form yeah. from that CLAR. Yeah. Yeah. And the rest of the information you just leave alone. Yeah. So we yeah. have it on our record, but we don't have authority to use it. Right. Okay. It's interesting because you really say, like, 50% of this yeah. There is a cost associated with seeing the council record. Just to know. Thank you. Right. But it's, it's also, you know, if you want to get licensed in other states, it's convenient. Broader. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Your motion uh, was to adopt the form um, as proposed in the packet. Uh, but we discussed today adding perhaps an informational sheet that would lay out some of the experience um, skills that candidates and their supervisors might want to be aware of. Um, do you want to, I guess, uh, direct the board or uh, committee staff to um, amend the form to include an information page with respect to skills? And can the information page just be a standalone thing where it's not? Uh, again, I'm, I'm trying to make it so that we can open up this pathway because otherwise, what's going to happen is that we're going to have to say, yeah, okay, fine, and then it's going to have to be brought back to us again in November. Okay, so um, that's a great idea. The form and the uh, proposed rulemaking could move by itself. The information sheet could be completely separate, but under the list of documents needed on the website or wherever, but associated with the right. form, uh, but not asking any information to be submitted in a, you know, over and above with the format. Yeah. So yeah, we, we can do that separate. That's a good idea. Okay. So that way that allows us to move this thing forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I would just like clarification. So the motion before us will open up a no experience no education. No education to move forward. But this proposed regulatory language, where does it say in this? It keeps saying six years of education and training experience. This says down uh, number two, down about four or five lines. Such candidates shall not be eligible for section three or four of the law unless they have a combination of six years. So I was trying to scan it. Where does it say it's only? Would you see what you're reading? Yeah, you're on, you're on the rest of oh, okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Look at this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, I know we want to remove barriers. I know we want to try to give opportunities to more people to do this. But it goes back to what I was saying about even just what's on the application. We are different. We have our own California parts. And if there's no education and it's experience only in say it's in construction or architecture, where do they get the plant material, the irrigation, the plot, you know, all the things that we are actually testing for? And so my concern is, yes, we open it up, we let them do it, we're going to do several years of study. Well, in the meantime, a hundred people may already be licensed, you can't take their license away. And the pass rates are really low, or they pass just barely. Do they really have the experience to be licensed? It, the um, pathway that would open up is not just, say, all experience, say, as an architect. There's, the proposal is to give up to three years of credit, for that example. So it's not like their total experience could just be an architect. So each one has the limit that they can claim credit for. And Are there education? Well, it's it's not it's education or training experience. Yeah. Courtney, if these proposals go through and you're an experience only pathway, how much of it has to be in landscape architecture? Um, say like if you were an architect. Um, it's, 
it's at least one year, but the way that it works is um, there's a maximum of one year under an architecture civil engineer. So, um, so it'd be five. I think it's a minimum, a minimum of two years would be required because the, the someone can have four years uh, the landscape contractor and then two years with the under the landscape architect. So that would be the minimum. So, right, okay, so uh, and, and maybe my after lunch brain is falling asleep, but so if I come in and I say I've experienced some, one of those years has to be under a landscape architect, mm -hmm. a licensed landscape architect, yeah, one year. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now how that can impact the art, art, you know, so if I do this, I'm getting paid, I'm doing my job, I have my one year. If I do this, I'm going to college, I'm not getting paid. I'm getting a certificate. So how is that going to, like, are more people going to drop out of school or not bother to go get their AA, the one year of education? That, that's kind of to me like you solve a problem, but then you add more problems. Um, I mean, I don't think we have the means to determine that type of, what it means in that sense, and if it will encourage people to choose this pathway over one over the other. Yeah, I, I would. And we're also trying to mirror the board's uh, requirements. Right. Well. Yeah. So yeah. The, direct the, the directive was to to follow their their requirements and kind of they have a And the reason we closed it down was because, like, because of the past rate, but, yeah, yeah. but now, now it didn't seem that it's appropriate to reinstitute it again. So that's what we're doing. Okay, so within the 29 states that have an experience only pathway, do we have what the pass rates are for those people? For the layer? Yeah, well, so if I'm an experience only in another state, mm -hmm. And what is that state pass rate for this category of experience only? We don't have that data. And I, I can't remember fully, but if memory serves, I don't think Clark collects that data. I think, I, think the state, the state, I think the state would have to maintain that data. Yeah. 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 We, we do that for ours. We, we calculate the pass rate by the school where they graduate and then if they were experienced only. So I think it would be up to the state to track that. We, we wouldn't try to know seeing that unless we went directly to each of those states. Okay. So if we pass the motion today and we open it up to an experience only category and we're going to study this for several years to then be able to justify how that goes back to our regulations, what in that period of time are we collecting? Just the pass rate? Does it relate to like the, how other states are tracking it? Mm -hmm. It could be a strategic plan of justice to collect whatever you want. And that's something you could determine later. That's but you well, that's appropriate that we go into more detail. Than mm -hmm. to to see, okay, so that's the strategic part of it. Okay. And to clarify, you know, um, studying it later is just for the purpose of to determine whether or not the regulation needs to be revised again to delineate the specific skills that should be, um, you know, experience should be received in if it's not working. If the experience only pathway isn't working because we don't, we're not requiring uh, a delineated list of expertise to be studied or uh, received through experience. That's the only reason to study it and because maybe it's not working, but it might be. We don't know. Right. 
So how many candidates a year do we get to a set of five? Um, about a hundred. A hundred per year. Uh, hundred, uh, okay, sorry, I'm coming to you when we went to the Um uh, About 150 are applicants. And of that hundred of those rough numbers are that actually pass the test and get licensed. Well, the way it works is um, it's not very consistent in terms of um, how people take the exam. Some people may just take one section at a time while others take all sections at once. So it's not really the same people that started the application process that are getting licensed on the thing here. It's more of like they continue on. Okay, so how many do we pre think or project that this would open up for? Is this going to open it up to another 100 people, another five people per year? Is this, like, are we expecting in mass these people to come in now and say, I want to get a license? That's something that we don't have information on now. We know that there are there is interest, but we don't know. Do you know about like is it one age, one group, or like, there's some letters here? And uh, yeah, I, I think we have, we don't have that information. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it would be speculation. Okay. <clears throat> you still have to have a certain amount of the five years. I mean, or six years of total. It's uh, education and or experience. Now it's going to be education yeah, and or experience. You still have to have a certain amount of that in your life and that's your part of it. Okay, then I would think that that under that landscape architect is where you learn your the part of for the LARE and all the different things of the LARE. If you're coming into California, the, 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 the special part of California if they qualify out of California, they're coming in and not work under a license landscape park in California, then maybe they don't have not had the uh, time or the experience to learn those things. However, studying for the CSB, you have to learn those things in order to pass it. So some of the discussion that we've had over the last several years and various issues is let the CSB be the the test or the gateway to say if you can pass it, then you're okay. That was Mr. Uh, Bowden brought up an uh, interesting point that I've not considered is the way the legislature looks at it. You know, a lot of people coming in and saying the CSC and they're failing it, they can't pass it. Then it's possible that they come back and say, wait a minute, what's wrong with what you're doing? Is that correct? No, I think really what, yeah. what I was referring to was the overall exam. If, if, if the pass rate on the overall exam, not just, I'm not talking necessarily specifically about the CSE, but if these people that are coming in taking the exam are not qualified enough and they take the exam and fail it, that's reflected in the overall test scores and that is what is reported when we do sunset review. So in the sunset review report, it's going to say exactly what our pass rates are over, over since the last, since the last sunset review. Right. So they're going to say, okay, here's 2014, 2015, 2016, what, whatever the periods are, and they'll be able to see. And if it's consistently low, that's where they, you know, you get a, you get somebody questioning, well, what's going on? How come, you know, because they have the national pass rate as well. So, and I bring this up probably every meeting since I've been on the committee, so for 10, 12 years now, you know, here's the national pass rate, let's say is 70% for one section, and the California pass rate for the exact same section is 59%, a difference of 11%. If I'm a legislator and I'm sitting there looking at that, my first question is why? Is it that the California candidates aren't as prepared as the, the, the rest of the country? You know, those would be the kinds of questions that I think you know, we've always been a little sensitive to. And we've tried to answer them by saying, well, because we have these alternate pathways that other states don't have, we allow community colleges, we have the extension program, we, um, you know, and now, and now if we open up this pathway, we would have um, experience-only pathways. Well, okay, I mean, there's some justification to some point. But again, it's like, where does the legislature, where, you know, business and professions committee from the state of California look at that and say, okay, well, why is it necessary to license landscape architects? Why can't you just be self-certified? You know, just you guys take care of yourself and, you know, get the state of California out of this whole thing because, you know, your test scores are just not, 
it's not holding up. That was my question. Right. So, but it's it's not just the CSE; it's the entire the, the entire area. layer that I'm more, you know, addressing as far as that particular comic goes. And that may just be my opinion. It may not be based in, in you know, realistically, but you know, there's you know, when you look at our pass rates back in, I forget what section it was, in program program manager's report. You know, you look at the total number of of uh, test uh, sections taken in California versus the country versus national, we're right at like 20%. So 20% of all test taking is, is being done here in California. That's pretty significant as far as I'm concerned. So when you see 20% and the numbers are skewed that much, some, in some cases, sometimes they're, they're not. In fact, in some years, California is scoring better than the national average. But that not, doesn't happen as often. But I understand the board has got a similar kind of situation on their test taking as well. So it's not unique, I, I don't think, just for land tree architecture. So I got a question regarding your comments. By, sh by having that data that comes out and say the pass rate is really low, does that say, as under the sunset, well, you're making it too hard, or hey, gee, we need this licensing because these people that want to practice aren't taking and passing this exam. Does it help us or hurt us, us to have low pass rates? Personally, I would think it would hurt us. But that's why would it hurt us? I would think it would go the other way. But. Um, in your sunset review report, you're going to be able to explain all of this. Because mm -hmm. first they're going to be like, okay, what's up with the pass rates? Oh, wow, they're low. And you're explaining why. In 2018, the board, uh, the board directed the committee to review experience only pathways, mm -hmm. did it through regulation. Um, you're going through it right now, so what is it, four years? Four years from now, you're going to probably have more data collected finally as to whether or not this is working. That data is going to be included in the sunset review report. Um, we noticed that the exam scores have fallen. Um, this is the data we collected. This is how we're going to address it. Right. I mean, at that point, you've got boom, boom, boom. This is everything you've been trying to do to get more people out there licensed, but also to protect consumers and to give candidates, you know, more information on how to be successful. Right. So you'll be able to justify the low scores because you're still tweaking it. You're still working on it. So it doesn't hurt us under sunset in, in several years and they say, well, wait, no one's passing or super low. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Can we, uh, can we just talk about sunset when we get Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So um, I just want to make sure that we have a motion on the floor. Mm -hmm. And a second. Okay, any other comments from the public? Okay, any other comments from the committee? Okay. Roll, please. Patricia Trout. Aye. Mark Trout Scott. Yes. Andrew Bowden. Aye. Susan Landry. Yes. Aye. David Allen Taylor Jr. Aye. Which is very 5 0. Okay. Um, before we move on to the next item, I just am hoping for staff purposes that we have a little bit of clarification on what the committee is looking for in the information sheet. Uh, because it sounds like it's something that we'll be bringing back. So, I just. No, no, no. Oh, it sounds like maybe that was already desired. Yeah. Okay, so then. Yeah, this is just going to be informative, so this isn't, it's not going to be viewed as an underground reg unless you're requiring candidates to do something. Okay, I have a opinion, but it sounded like the reg was going to carry in the information sheet was going to come back for a further review. Unless you want it to come back for a review. No. Okay. 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 Um, we're going to take a uh, five minute break, a ten minute break. Thank you. So it is um, 10 minutes to uh, we'll reconvene at 2 o'clock.